Hello, everyone. McCoy Rothman here. Um, I'm here joined by uh, Steve Slepsevic, excuse me if I uh, mispronounced that, of SRP Strategic Response Partners. Um, you know, in light of our latest tragedy here in Hawaii, a massive wildfire which devastated a massive part of Maui in Lahaina, which is a very historical place. Um, not just historically, but families, businesses, a lot of loss, a lot of devastation. Steve has been um, here, dealt with you know, over 14,000 claims nationwide and in other countries as well, responding to natural disasters as these. And um, I just wanted to jump on here to get a little bit of clarity from somebody who deals with stuff like this. For some of the people out there that may be in shock, it's going to take a while. I know that there's an evacuation order um, in place. And just what are some of the things that people can do um, following this tragic event? We want to send our prayers and aloha out, first of all, to everyone um, affected by this. And, um, you know, so just maybe introduce yourself, Steve, a little bit about yourself, what you do. And I will get into maybe what should people do once the evacuation order is lifted and the processes of rebuilding lives, families, and getting back. You know, and it's going to be a long road and just get back to where we all can be, um, you know, enjoying Hawaii again. Yes. So, Makua, I want to thank you for actually initiating the call, reaching out for those in Hawaii to actually bring a sense of hope and what is the road to recovery? What happens in this situation? And it seems like not that long ago, it was the other way around where we were dealing with the wildfires in Malibu and some of our mutual friends were back and forth on the phone as to what to do. And we were down there working with the local sheriff's department when the evacuation orders were in place and also our fire teams that was doing private fire structure protection in Malibu. So the, I'm just gonna share with some of the knowledge that we have because I've been doing this since 1989. Uh, this is all I've ever done and we specialize in this, but just so that the audience knows this is strictly educational. This is just to educate because we're not here to be hired in a capacity. This is just strictly as the knowledge, sharing knowledge, and then empowers everybody on the whole group. So one of the best things that people need to be aware of is that once the evacuation orders are, are, are lifted, and that's going to be after search and rescue has completed their task of going through the buildings to make sure that uh, that part is handled. So once one search and rescue is complete, then the recovery efforts come in and they're going to be looking to restore power and infrastructure. Everything that has to do with the infrastructure in that area to terminate gas lines, terminate power lines and basically clear the debris out of the roadway just to remove as many hazards as possible. But once those evacuation orders are lifted and people can come back to their property to see what status is it burned to the ground? Is it a partial loss? or they're dealing with heavy smoke and ash contamination of their property. So they're gonna be looking for, to avoid any electrical, any sharp objects, and understand that with the winds, many times the debris that's get blown on the road, there'll be nails, there'll be sharp objects. So if you're going into that area, it would be wise to carry a tire repair kit, uh, uh, fix a flat with you, and just be prepared, make sure your, your, your spare tire's full. And if you're going in there, I strongly, strongly recommend that people Wear gloves, not go through the debris, but wear gloves and also put an, a respirator mask on and not breathe in that area because there'll be trucks that'll be driving through that. There'll be vehicles driving through that. And all that dust ash particulate is from burnt vehicles, burnt uh, chemicals, right, that have been airborne and aerosolized. So this stuff is highly carcinogenic. And the tough thing about it is this fine, fine, fine particulate will get into your lower lungs and can cause some serious irritation. And in some cases, the onset of childhood asthma in people. So you want to type of avoid that type of stuff when you're going back in the area. Just be extremely safe. And if you're going through a property that's been uh, that has had like a total loss and stuff like that, you want to be careful on how you approach the property. Because again, there's a lot of contaminants there, a lot of sharp objects. And if it's a partial fire, you may have a structural issue that's involved and you may want to have a structural engineer come out and take a look at it before you enter the premises, just as an additional layer of safety. So we don't we don't want people once again, 
we are not doctors or anything like that. Like we said, this is just informational, but we do not want people just rushing back to their properties as soon as the um, order is lifted and also to follow the guidelines of the um, uh, first responders or law enforcement that is there. They put in um, orders in place for your safety. And uh, these are just maybe some things that you could keep in mind when you do go back. And what are some of those hazards? What should people be aware of when they are approaching the properties? You know, they get through the debris, they finally get through, um, you know, the barricades, whatever it be, be, they make it back to their property. What are some of the ways people may be um, able to safely approach their properties again? So it, two two things. If it's a fire, uh, a property that's had a total loss on it, the best thing to do is not to disturb it, right? What people have to understand is the damage is already done, right? On the ones that have been burned to the ground, the damage is already done. And there may be fine, like jewelry or things that they're trying to salvage. I totally understand that, right? But you want to kind of go through there safely because if it was an older property, you may have asbestos in there, you may have lead in there, and now you're breathing this stuff in as you're digging for your jewelry or trying to salvage some items, you know? There's a proper way to go about it. I always say, put the gloves on, put the respirator mask on. If you're going to go through, through there and there is asbestos and lead, you may want to have somebody who you go with that knows how to remediate and walk and work in those environments that has a Tyvek suit on and who's a licensed asbestos contractor to assist you in that process. But before any cleanup happens, I always tell people you have to document it like it's a crime scene, right? So even if you just had a ton of ash and fire debris that hit your house and it didn't burn to the ground, right? The thing that you want to do is you want to do a complete 360 of the house, right? Before you walk inside, walk all the way around the house and videotape everything. Your camera phone, your video and your camera phone is going to be your best friend because you want to take pictures of anything and everything. So there may be um, things that have blown, that debris that has blown, that has striked this, the, the stucco or the siding. Um, that has maybe burned some trees down or some vegetation, maybe irrigation that had some hot spot fires. You want to photograph everything before you do any cleanup. And I always tell people on the exterior of the 360, have somebody get up on top of the roof, as long as it's not a burnt structure, right? And it's safe to do it. You may want to have a roofer or yourself go up on top of the roof if it's safe and take photographs. Because many times what people don't understand is in these wildfires, these embers will burn for miles away and they'll land on these roof and there'll be little burnt spots all over the shingles or, or the tile or whatever the roof membrane may be and have all these little burnt marks and burnt holes in the roof that six months from now, a year from now, or several years from now, you might not realize that your roof was compromised by the wildfire and this leaking goes through the plywood deck and then you got dry rot and they got mold in the attic and you have all types of subsequent damage as a result of that you know so let me get this straight this is for documentation process prior to getting into a property that wasn't totally flattened by the fire because you're going up to structure that may be a few miles away people that are downwind from the fire that exactly can, you know certain things that they want to go and document or look at before they do open a business or go back into a structure that could be compromised from the fire even though it was miles away correct so i'm going to jump back to the ones that burned to the ground my strong suggestion is get a temporary fence put around the property so you don't have looters going through your stuff you know put a temporary fence up if you feel the need and it's a high-end property and you're looking to protect some valuables in it i always strongly suggest get a security guard and post them up at the property but again if you're looking for insurance purposes do they cover that type of stuff i always say call your agent if you have a premier type insurance policy you have to explain it to them that i'm preventing any further damage i need authorization to put a security guard and that you will reimburse me for that security protecting my property so you can have some peace of mind because you're not going to be staying there obviously right the other so thing how does, so how okay. does fema and homeowners insurance work in some of these scenarios so that people you know don't get taken advantage of i know just 
today I was looking at my homeowner's insurance, some flood insurance. Um, you know, I have some roof stuff going on myself. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not very knowledgeable, I'm sure, like a lot of these people who have lost their homes totally might not know where to start, you know, call their agent. I mean, I know there's going to be a lot of claims going in. You know, how would somebody that's just lost everything, just in layman's term, just uh, for educational purpose, how would they start that process and go about getting that finished? Yeah, so FEMA has, uh, the, they typically will step in and cover certain things that are not covered by insurance, but you'll have to file the forms. And what I always suggest with people is that if you know you have damage, the sooner you get your forms and applications filled out with FEMA, the better off you are because then you're at the front of the line rather than waiting a week or two. And then now you're in with the whole bunch of people, right? So if you get at the front of the line, your file is going to get processed quicker. You're going you're to have that process going. Now, if it's a business, there's also SBA will give you disaster coverage, sometimes loans of, you know, one and a half to 2%. I don't know what it is exactly, but I would also look at SBA if you're a business and you suffered from the fires. And I know a lot of people have, but the sooner they get ahead of it, the better off they're going to be, right? The third thing is, yes, your insurance policy. And like you said, you're looking through your insurance policy and that has got to be the most boring read. And it's a lot of legalese, right? And some of it is very confusing. What does it really mean? It's not really made in simple terms, right? It's meant really to be complex. I always say, ask your insurance agent for questions as to what your coverages are. What's your limitations on the dwelling? You know, is there a, a cap on smoke and ash contamination from wildfires? Because some policies will have a cap of $5,000 on the insurance policy, right? But again, I'm not an insurance adjuster. I'm not a private adjuster. Those are questions you really want to ask the agent. But I always say like this, every smart man knows to get a second opinion, right? And one of the best companies that does complimentary reviews is the people that deal on the claim side of it. They're not the agent who sold you the policy. It's the same thing that if you went to buy a car, you talk to the salesman, you buy the, the, the vehicle that you like at the dealership but that's not the mechanic. The claims is the mechanic. And there's a company called Skyline Adjusters and they, they're not there to sign it. They're just simply to do a review, right? So the gentleman's name, I believe is Jeffrey Major. He's one of the key principals. They'll review the policy and just like your agent, you're just checking the two, right? This is the second opinion. These are my coverages, this is my coverages. Here's what my bucket is that I can go get and return in my receipts for the cost that it's gonna take. Now really 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 critical thing everything is in the documentation if you had smoke blow into your house from the outside and there's ash i'm going to tell you where the people need to look and what areas need to be properly remediated because this is carcinogenic right you don't want your little kids on the carpet playing you don't want to be sleeping in your, in your bedroom in your master bedroom and you have the attic can lights leaching and all this dust and ash particulate falling over your bed as you're sucking this thing into your lungs because the buildings and houses breathe, right? So the areas that the smoke and ash is gonna push into is the attic. It'll push in through the dormer vents, the vents in the house. It'll push in through the windows and through the window seals. And then you'll see like this little black ash that's around near the window openings where it vents. You'll see it by the garage doors, even though the garage doors closed, you'll see all this ash that'll be blowing into people's garages. You'll see it by your doorways. So attic, the vents, the, the windows, the doors, and what you want to make sure is that when you put all that stuff together, you want somebody to put a, an estimate together for you to clean out the insulation from your attic, HEPA vac everything, encapsulate, clean all your ducts, replace all your filters in your, in your filtration air conditioning system. You want them to wipe down your walls, wipe down all the sills, and areas where there's like that flat wall paint, when you rub that stuff to take the, the, the real fine stuff off the walls, you're going to most likely have to repaint it because you're smudging it. Not always, but a lot of times. Cleaning the carpets, and if it's heavy, you may have to replace the carpets and the pad, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to want to clean all your soft goods. That means pillows, blankets, everything like that. So in the cleaning side of it, there are several companies that do a great job. So if you want, I'll pull them up. I can always send it to you, Makua, and you can 
reach out to those companies that just specialize in cleaning smoke and ash contents to give you an example. Well, you know, I know, um, you know, talking about the insurance and the cleanup is good. What are some of the things people need to look into for immediate help, immediate assistance, food, water, shelters? Um, I know some of these people have been displaced from their homes. I'm sure there'll be shelters set up. Are there any programs out there that you know of that certain counties or states um, have out there that you guys dealt with to get people aid right away? Because I know it's going to take a long time for the claims. It's going to take a long time to rebuild and, and, and whatnot. But what are some of the more immediate things that people can get relief from or programs that they may be able to link into? So you got the two things. People that are that are tenants that may say that they have tenant insurance, the, the tenant's insurance will cover their contents and many times their relocation costs to relocate to a new apartment. Those that don't have insurance can also file a claim with FEMA. But then there is also the Red Cross that is going to be set up and the Salvation Army that'll set up like an, a, an evacuation center and a place for them to temporarily stay. Sometimes they'll even put them up in housing. FEMA does that sometimes and so does like the American Red Cross where they'll put people in temporary housing. Um, there'll be companies that'll come out there and provide food as well. Um, there's several nonprofits that do an incredible job. Samaritan's Purse does an incredible job of really kind of stepping up on the medical and the healthcare side of it for people that are in those areas. Um, and again, Operation uh, Barbecue is a great another resource. They're the ones that actually come out and they'll bring trailers and they'll set up and they'll barbecue for the entire community. They'll cook from chicken, pulled pork, and they're, they're a nonprofit and they've always been one of the most amazing in every disaster zone that we've been. They're incredible. So there'll be quite a few people that are gonna come in and as long as what I'll do is I'll keep sending you information. So if they set up at a state at a place, you could push push it out to your audience. Hey, free food, barbecue, pulled pork, burgers. You know, uh, they do an incredible job, and the food's really good. Um, and they're there to feed the first responders and also the community, the, the people that have been impacted by it. You know, then also keep in mind that people in those areas, a lot of the cell towers go out, so if their phones out. Uh, many times the, the Verizon, AT&T, uh, T-Mobile, sometimes they'll just give them free service, free of charge during the time of the rebuilding of their of their infrastructure. They'll bring in mobile telecom communications on these on these trucks that will bring the antennas up and mm -hmm. their, their cell service will be back on. But sometimes that takes about up to a week just so people and the main thing people have to understand, I think, if they take this is that the road to recovery is not easy. The damage is done. Be patient with one another. You know, the, these guys are trying to get their lines up and get the power back on to the thing. So the more people can kind of stay out of their way so they get the job done and kind of, you know, show a little love towards each other. Um, that's what it's going to take because these things are not, not easy. And then one other thing that I want to leave with you is that when people file a claim with their insurance company, okay, and they get an estimate, and they feel like they've been like it may not be the best offer offer that the insurance company has. I always say get a second opinion and get a restoration contractor that's certified in smoke and ash remediation. And these guys are usually IRCRC certified in what they call S500, S520. They have a master restore on staff. And there's there's few on the island. There's very few on the island. But those are the type of vendors I would look for. You understand who are really there for the customer who have the proper qualifications and who can generate a proper estimate to restore the house and lastly and most importantly when that remediation is done right and the person says hey i'm a contractor i did the job i cleaned everything and it's contaminant free you want to get an environmental consultant okay to go in there and test those areas and visually and also pull samples that they actually properly remediated, send the samples to the lab. And if it comes up clean, that environmental consultant will provide them a clearance. Why? For health and safety, for safe reoccupation. And if they were ever to sell the property, right? If they were ever to sell the property, they can say that it was properly remediated after the wildfire and share it with the new buyer. And if there's a tenant there, the tenant can never say, oh, after the wildfires, you know, I developed this cancer, this lung issue, 
uh, these allergies, uh, they can show clearly the documentation that they follow the correct protocols to fully restore the property and get back to some sort of normalcy because that never really happens because after every wide area disaster, we're always reminded, remember when the wildfires happen? And that will that is what will live in many people's minds as a result of what happened. You know, it's unfortunate, but in the other end of it, the silver lining is the communities really come together, right? And this is the time for us to show up. This is the time for us so, to show up. So we'll go, we'll go over that one more time. Just so evacuation order is lifted. People should definitely follow the laws and wait until these things are lifted. Don't rush back to the properties because of the uh, hazards, you know, inhalation of smoke, inhalation of debris. And maybe they just touch on, on a little bit of the hazards associated with maybe jumping the gun and not waiting to the proper time to go back and check on your property where it's partially damaged, a little damaged or fully burnt to the ground. Yeah, I mean, you're you're stepping out an area where there's wires, right? They're, they're, they're trying to get the power back on. And if you may step across an energized line, there goes your life, right? So there's a lot of hazards. There's gas lines that are ruptured. There's a lot of hazards out there that you're stepping into. It's a war zone. So until those areas are terminated and deemed safe to, re to go back, what are you doing? You're rushing into what? To go see fire damage? It's going to be fire damage tomorrow. And it'll be the fire dam same damage the next day. You know what I mean? So I always say, people, be patient. Let the first responders cap it, terminate, cap, encapsulate these areas and make it safe so the general public can get back into those zones and start doing it. The things that people could do right now is get their policy reviewed by their adjuster, right? By, by, not their adjuster, by their, their agent and by Skyline adjusters. Understand some. The adjuster that's coming out to the property, and I'm going to share this with you so you're aware of it, okay? It's an insurance company that you paid a premium to that's sending out their adjuster. It's not your adjuster. So many times people go, oh, my adjuster's coming out. No, 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 it's the insurance company's adjuster, right? And if you had an auto accident, you can have the insurance adjuster come out and estimate your car. Or you could take it to, if you have a Mercedes to the Mercedes dealership, and I can assure you, in my experience, the Mercedes dealerships Estimate's going to be much higher than the guy that came out to write you a sheet on the side of the road, right? For one of many reasons. Many times he'll tear apart the car and do a little more investigative work, right? To see what all the damage is under the undercarriage, behind the plastic. You know what I mean? What else was damaged? You know, visually, when you start taking things apart, and that's the service that you want to look at when you're getting into the claim side of it. You want to make sure that you properly document everything. Whether you do a drone survey over your total burn property or you totally survey your house, roof, exterior walls, attic, you know, and again, electronics, electronics many, time, many times will be impacted. Your garage tools need to be cleaned and everything needs to be deconned. And if they're doing that, they should be using an air scrubber, like a commercial air scrubber. So as you're cleaning it, whatever dust is being pulled up out of the out of the area is getting sucked into that air scrubber and then being pumped out of the home. Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate it. Thank you for the information. It's going to help a lot of people um, just get a little more clear on maybe the steps they should follow. Just wanted to reach out and, you know, just use some of my contacts to see how I can get more education, more information across to um, the victims being uh, affected by this wildfire. I want to say thank you very much, and uh, we'll be in touch, and uh, thank you for the information. Yeah, and any questions that your 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 customers or not customers, your friends and family and people that you know have, they feel free to ask have them ask the questions. You can send them to me. They can call me. I'm here to answer questions. This I'm just a consultant on on hospitals, municipalities, you know, logistics centers, large shipping ports and airports. That's the the space we operate in. But I'm when, when it comes to the, I think the people that are overlooked are friends and family, right? And that's the purpose of the call was to educate them on what they need to know so they can empower themselves and take this on on the road recovery. So Makua, again, really mahalo. Thank you. I appreciate you, my brother. Thank this you very much. Aloha. I'm here for you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah.